I Okay, you all ready to go? Thanks for coming. Uh, I appreciate that. Today we're doing an overview of Texas history part two. And uh, if you were here a month ago, I took you from the 1.3 billion year old granite mountain we know as Enchanted Rock, and I brought you up to the Battle of San Jacinto. And that's where Texas won its independence from Mexico. And we're going to pick it up right there today. And that is the beginning of the Republic of Texas. So we're going to go from 1836, the Republic of Texas, all the way up to 1900, to the Spindle Top Oil Well. And that's where I'm going to end because I figure you all know everything that there is to know about Texas history since 1900. <laughs> 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 if you don't mind, I'm Sit down while we do it. Part three. Quiet. <laughs> okay, let's look at some some uh, geography. Uh, the Republic of Texas looked like this on the map. Uh, it's it's boundary from the Sabine River up to the Red River to the Hundredth Meridian up to the Arkansas River to its uh, source near Leadville, Colorado, and all the way up to the 42nd parallel. That was, was established by a treaty between the U.S. and Spain in 1819. So this border was fixed in 1836, and of course the Gulf of Mexico is down there. And when Texas created its republic, we claimed the Rio Grande as our western boundary. Mexico didn't agree with us, but it really didn't matter. So our, our western boundary was the Rio Grande River, all the way up to its headwaters near Creed, Colorado, and then all the way up to the 42nd parallel, and that makes up the Republic of Texas. So that was, was Texas for about 10 years. Now, after that Battle of San Jacinto, we had already appointed an interim president named David Burnett, or Burnett, as, as the road we've got out here. And so several things happened pretty fast after the Battle of San Jacinto. The Treaty of Velasco was between the Texans and Santa Ana uh, in Velasco, and that was May the 14th. Uh, a little while later, there was a fort up in, uh, by Grosbeck uh, called Fort Parker, and it experienced a Comanche attack, and that, that, they captured some people there, and that comes to play a, a little later on in the story. Cynthia Ann Parker was one of the people who got captured, and you'll hear about her uh, later on. So also in June of that same year, uh, we established the Texas Rangers, and we created several forts, one of which we named Fort Colorado, and that's here in Austin. We're going to look at that in a little bit. The town of Houston was founded uh, later on that year by the Allen brothers. There were really three towns in Texas at this time. San Antonio is the big one. Down at Mount Goliath, then called La Bahia, is the other Spanish community or Mexican community, and Nacogdoches, which is kind of a mixed. So those were the three towns that existed, and Houston started up in 1836. Uh, Texans immediately wanted to be annexed by the United States, but they didn't want any part of us because we were a slave state, and that was a huge issue and they weren't prepared to accept another slave state in the United States. We elected Sam Houston as our president in October of 1836. A town of Columbia down by Brazoria on the Brazos River is where he was inaugurated. Uh, we, we formed the Rangers, we hired the Rangers, we built forts, we made peace with a few of the Indians, we negotiated the treaty with the Cherokees, and in December, we moved the government to Houston. So Houston became the capital of Texas. And that same year, Stephen Austin, who was really an important early part of Texas, he died at age 46 in December. 
and in 1837 early, the first ships came in by sea and made it all the way up to Houston. And Texas opened its first opera house in Houston in January of 1837. Can you imagine that in that point of time? So we had a string of what was then the frontier forts between 1838 and 1849. Fort Houston was over in the eastern Texas, Milam, Little River, uh, Colorado was there by Austin. That's out uh, about Springdale and MLK, roughly, if you know East Austin. That's about where Fort Colorado was located. There's a historical marker out there. So we printed our money. This is a picture of a $20 bill from the Republic of Texas. Uh, Sam Houston signed it. And it's a promissory note. It, it says, if you give me $20, I promise to give you $22 back a year later. And uh, we issued a bunch of those. And <laughs> we didn't have any money to pay them back. <laughs> and so the value of our currency declined by more than 50% within a couple of years. Nobody wanted those things once, once you had them. Today, uh, you can buy them, and they cost a little more than $20. All right, then uh, we, we inaugurated our second president, Mirabeau Lamar, Lamar, think Lamar Avenue in Austin. And he was diametrically opposite from Sam Houston in what he believed in. Houston wanted to, to you know, make peace with the Indians and bring them into the society. And he wanted to join the United States. Lamar said, none of either of those. I want to run all the Indians out of Texas and the, I want nothing to do with the United States. I'm going to take Texas all the way from the Rio Grande to the Pacific Ocean. So we had two different approaches by our first two presidents. We selected a new capital in January of 39, named it after Stephen Austin, and uh, the legislature actually met here in November of that first year. Uh, so I told you about Lamar and the, and the Indians. He, 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 uh, ran the Cherokees out of Texas pretty quick. Uh, and uh, he starts uh, treaties with other countries because he's a Republican, he wants to expand. So we made our first uh, commerce treaty with Holland in September of 1839. And then we started discussions with Great Britain about maybe, uh, maybe we'll join uh, and be a part of uh, the United Kingdom. So we were talking to, to Britain uh, Mexico was invited to those discussions, but they were still firmly convinced that Texas was still a part of Mexico, and they wanted nothing to do with discussions like that. So in 1839, uh, uh, we, had, we had lots of Comanches coming down and, and capturing people. So down near, uh, near Cuero, the Lockharts lived on the, on the Guadalupe River. And the Comanches came in, and they captured a young girl named Matilda, Matilda Lockhart. And they had other captures, but then later on that year, up here at Leander, uh, there was a group of survey or surveying party, which included both men and women. The Comanches attacked them, they killed all the men, and they captured Mrs. Webster and several children. And we had two or three other places where the Comanches had captured new, I'm going to call them Americans for the moment, but new American immigrants, and, and we, we Texans didn't like that. So we, we told the Comanches we need to have a parlay and talk about all these captives. So we all agreed the Comanches would come to San Antonio and they were to bring all of the captives and we were going to figure out how to, I don't know what we were going to do, but we were going to get our little children, the captives, back from the Comanches. It turned out that only one of the chiefs came and uh, he says, I have no authority to do anything. but. He brought Matilda Lockhart. And by that time, the Comanche women were very jealous of Matilda, thinking maybe the Comanche men might think she was a pretty girl. So they had taken live sticks in a fire and burned her nose off. And so it was not a very pretty scene, and it really made the Texans mad when they saw Matilda. So it didn't take long, and they got in a big fight called the Council House fight. And 30 of the Comanche warriors uh, and three women and two children were killed and seven Texans were killed in that fight. And we turned one of the Comanche women loose and 
told her to go back to your people and tell them we want to arrest those kids. That didn't sit very well with the Comanches. And they had way more people than there were Texans at that point in time. So they, they mass mustered up 600 Comanche warriors on horses. And they had some Kiowa allies and they rode all the way down from the north and they attacked and basically took Victoria and then they went on down to what's today Port Navaca. It was called Linville on, on, uh, on Navaca Bay down there and they sacked Linville, ran all the people out in boats in the bay, uh, stole everything they could get from the warehouses that were down and then they returned up the Guadalupe, this big group of Indians did, toward what was called Comancheria, which is really just North Texas at that time. Uh, but the Texans knew what was going on, and they, and they set a trap for them. So just near the town of Lockhart down here, uh, these 600 Comanches are coming up, and 200 Texans uh, ambushed them as they were coming up, and they had a big fight, and uh, it's the first use of, of a cavalry charge and the first use of repeating rifles by the Texans. And it was an overwhelming victory for the Texans. They killed over 80 Comanches and ran the rest of them off. Uh, I'm sure they dropped their top hats and whatever else they had gotten down in Linville. Uh, two of the Texans were killed. So that's the Battle of Plum Creek, which again occurred down by Lockhart. Now let's go fast forward to 1841 in Austin. Uh, again, we're a republic. We had invited the French to create an embassy here. They did so. They sent an ambassador, somebody named Saline. And uh, the reason that they were coming was that France, at Texas's invitation really, was going to be given like uh, three million acres somewhere out west. And they were going to bring in 8,000 French families and build forts. And they were going to create a little France in this new place called the Republic of Texas. Sam Houston had supported that idea, uh, but it did not pass the Republic Senate. And so that plan failed, and uh, it made uh, the uh, uh, ambassador mad. But what really made him mad was Richard Bullock's pigs. Richard Bullock had a hotel down just off of 6th Street, just west of Congress on 6th Street. And he had a bunch of pigs, which he just let run loose. And you know where the French embassy is. It's still there today. You can visit it about maybe 7th and just west of Congress. Uh, anyway, uh, Bullock's pigs got up <laughs> in the embassy. And here's what the, here's what the ambassador said. Your pigs invaded my stable of horses, ate the corn, and even penetrated to my very bedroom and devoured his linen and chewed his papers. <laughs> He was not happy and he left in a huff. And it took Sam Houston several months to finally convince him to come back. But he did so and he returned in 1842. That's called a pig war. <laughs> Lamar is still president. He's trying to look west and he says, you know, Santa Fe is way up there and uh, they're not really sure they're a part of Texas. But they are, I think. And so I'm going to send a, a bunch of men up there and explain to them how they're a part of Texas. And so he, he rounds up 320 men and 21 wagons, and they marshaled up here uh, out 183 where Brushy Creek is, and they set off for New Mexico. And it took them five months, and they were lost several times. They almost died. They ran out of water. They didn't know where they were. It was an absolute horror story. They made it into New Mexico as far as Tucumcari, and that's as far as they got. The New Mexico soldiers came down and basically captured them. They, they gave up without a fight. They never made it to Santa Fe. Uh, so they took them to Mexico uh, and uh, uh, put them in prison uh, in, in Mexico. Also, in 1842, again, the Mexicans do not accept Texas as an independent republic, so they send an army up, uh, and they actually occupied San Antonio, Goliad, and Victoria. Those were Hispanic or Mexican cities at that point in time. And uh, 
the, the people who lived in Austin said, my goodness, they're only 79 miles away in San Antonio. They're going to come here. And so we had the, the two cannons that we used at San Jacinto called the Twin Sisters and some other cannons. So we mounted the Twin Sisters and we pointed them at the river crossing. And fortunately, the, the Mexican army decided they weren't going to come here. So they went back to Mexico for a while. And then later on that year, another 1,500 soldiers came back from Mexico and reoccupied San Antonio. And this time we had some fights. And if you have ever uh, ridden on Highway 71 through LaGrange, if you looked over there across the river, there's that sort of mountain over there. That's called Monument Hill. And it, uh, it honors uh, 53 men from LaGrange who had marshaled and went up to fight these Mexican soldiers. And it was an absolute massacre. They all got killed. So those Texans are buried on Monument Hill. Uh, 36 of them were killed. And uh, uh, we did have a battle with some more Texans, which we won uh, at near San Antonio at Salado Creek. And so this army of Mexicans retires. So that's two invasions in 1842. Uh, Sam Houston is back president again. And we don't like the fact that the, that the Mexicans have invaded us twice. So we formed a militia, and we sent them down to the Rio Grande to kind of clean things up, and we gave them the instructions, if you think you can win, feel free to invade Mexico. <laughs> so this guy named Somerville led these men down, and they went to, to near Laredo, and they actually captured Laredo, and they, they looked the situation over, and they said, I don't, Somerville, who was the leader, says, I don't think we can do any good in Mexico. He says to his men, we've got Laredo, we've told him we don't like it, we're going to go back back home again. About half of his men, uh, oops, anyway, about half of his men said, no, I'm not going to do it. And so they form themselves up and decide they're going to go into Mexico, which they did, to the town of Mayer, and they had a battle, and they lost big time. And 176 of those men were captured by the Mexicans and put in prison in a very infamous prison, prison called Pe, uh, Peyote, Perote. And included in this uh, 176 were, were two famous Texas Rangers, one of which you've probably heard of, Samuel Walker. He's the guy that invented the, the six gun, the famous six gun. He went up to show Colt how to make a six gun that would work in Texas. So that's Samuel Walker. And this other guy you might not have heard of is a really interesting character. His name was Bigfoot Wallace, but that's another story. So anyway, we've got these 176 men in prison in Mexico. They briefly escaped and were recaptured. And the Mexicans said, because of that uh, action, 10% of you are going to have to die. And so they put 176 beans in a hat 17 of which were black and the rest of which were white. And each man, and this is a picture of it, each, each Texan walks up and he reaches in the hat and he pulls out a bean. 17 of them were black. They lined those 17 men up against the wall and shot them. Uh, and two years later, the rest of that 176 were released. So that's the black bean episode. Another Austin story, this is 1842. Uh, Houston is the president. Again, I mentioned the, the Mexicans are in San Antonio. And Houston says, you know, that Austin is not a very good place to have your captain. It's just too close to San Antonio and that Mexican army. So he says, we're going to move the capital to Houston. And the only thing that's important with the government are the land records. That shows who owns what. And we had the land office here in Austin. So Houston sends some Texas Rangers up. And says, in the dark of the night, slip down there to the land office, about 6th in Congress, and, and ease in and get the land records and load them up in wagons and haul them back to Houston. Yep. So those rangers were doing that just about dawn on the morning of December the 30th. They're just finishing up loading the land records in the wagons and about ready to leave Austin. And who wakes up 
Angelina Everly. She worked for Richard Bullock, and she's doing something at dawn. She goes outside and she looks across Congress Avenue. She recognizes what's going on. And they had a, a cannon sitting up down there, loaded, to repel the Indians in case they had an Indian attack. So she touches off the cannon, makes a big boom, waked all the men up. They get on their horses and form a posse, and they go after the wagons, and they catch up with them, and, and there's no battle or anything. The rangers who had the wagons, they said, okay, you can have the land records back. So they brought the land records back to Austin, and they've been here ever since. So we came that close to not being the capital of Texas. And you might have noticed that Angelina's got her statue with a bronze cannon down there on 6th Street today. So if you want to thank somebody for Texas, for Austin being the capital, go tip your hat to Angelina Everly on, on 6th Street. Well, uh, time passed. We had several more attempts to join the United States. Finally, uh, there was some agreement by some diplomats in 1844 that says, okay, we, we propose that Texas uh, be annexed to the United States. But the U.S. Senate rejected it again, 35 to 16, under the same grounds of a slavery state, which we don't want. Two things happened that caused that to change. One is Houston uh, made it known that he had gone back to Great Britain and said, we really want to be a part of Great Britain. And so the United States says, wait a minute, I don't think we want that to happen to have our western boundary be Great Britain. And so that had a little change of attitude in Washington, D.C. And the other thing that really happened was uh, we, we had an election and, and Polk won and he favored annexing Texas. So they reinstituted the process. And in February of 1845 with a new president and the threat of Texas joining England, U.S. Congress says, okay, We'll make an offer. You're, we'll welcome you as a state if you want to be one. And Mexico says, wait a minute. We, <laughs> we will recognize you as an independent republic if you agree not to join the, the United States. So Texas Congress had a vote, and they rejected Mexico, and they voted to become a state. Uh, they put it, they, they made up a, const a constitution, and they put it to popular vote. And the citizens of Texas voted 7,600 to 430 to join the states. And on December the 9th, 1845, President Polk signed it, and Texas became the 28th state. And there was a big ceremony on February the 19th, 1846, downtown at what was then the state capitol. Anson Jones was our last Republic president. And they had a big ceremony, and I'm sure the band played. And they lowered the, the Lone Star flag of the Republic, and they raised the United States flag. And Anson Jones says, the final act of this great drama is now performed. The Republic of Texas is no more. And so we were a state. Here are the two key terms that were a part of, we both agreed to. One of them is, we kept all of our public lands, which were quite a bit, and we also kept all the money that we borrowed, which was also quite a bit. And uh, we have had and still have the provision to divide ourselves into five states. So anytime Texans decide, and it's a constitutional amendment and all that that means, but if we decided that we wanted to be five states, we have the ability to do that. Hard to imagine that would happen, but that's there. Uh, over the years, there were, all the way up to 1975, there were numerous proposals to take advantage of this division, and all of them have failed so far. Now we start to get some, some European immigrants. We had American immigrants, and now we're getting European immigrants, and the Germans came first. This guy Friedrich Ernst and his family uh, we're going to go uh, to Missouri, they, and in New Orleans, they started hearing these stories about free land in Texas that sounded pretty good, so they changed their plans, and they came to Texas, and they uh, settled in the little town of Industry, right here in Austin County, which is Francis 
my home county. And so they are the first German settlers to come to Texas. They soon wrote letters back, and a couple of years later, there was another group of Germans came over and settled nearby in the little town we call Catspring today, Katzenquelle in German. And uh, the Von Raiders were the leader of that, but there was also a young man named Kleber who was in that group, and his uh, descendants still owned the King Ranch. So the, the King Ranch uh, ancestor uh, was among these group of Germans that came to Texas in 1834. Then 10 years later, the more, the more common story we know about German immigration, a whole bunch of them came in under this uh, society uh, for the protection of German immigrants in Texas and some nobles put together in Germany and brought in several thousand Germans. Uh, they called it the Autosverein. And they settled in New Braunfels and Fredericksburg. And you probably know more of that story than you do the, the earlier stuff. So Germans were our first non-American European immigrants. Uh, they got along with the Indians really well, and they had to because there was a lot of Comanches out there. So they actually had a treaty in 1847 uh, up on the San Saba River, and uh, they they formed a treaty and they agreed they live with each other peacefully, and both sides honored that treaty. And it is said that that's the only treaty in Texas with the Indians that was ever kept by the Texas side. <coughs> so shortly after, then the second group of immigrants come from uh, Europe, and these were some Czechs. There was a guy named Leshiker that got a bunch of people, and there were two sailboats, 1851 and 1853, that brought family groups of Czechs over, and they came and settled in the same place among the Germans in Austin County. They had been attracted by a, a, a Czech, actually, named Berkman, who earlier, he was a preacher, and he was in Cat Spring, and he was writing letters back in Czech telling them how good it was, and that's why they came. So we go to 1846, and we have the Mexican-American War, uh, which which came about because Texas annexed Mexico, and I mean, annexed, United States annexed Texas, and Mexico didn't like that. So that's how we got in the, in the War of 1846. Uh, in that war, Zachary Taylor leads a bunch of, 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 of American soldiers down to what is now Brownsville. Uh, there was nothing there at the time. Of course, Matt Morris was across the river, but he creates Fort Brown, which became Brownsville. And uh, the Mexicans sent some troops across, and they ambushed a little patrol. And that started the war. And so on May the 13th, President Polk declares war on Mexico. Uh, that lasted a couple of years. There were some big battles uh, down around Brownsville, Palo Alto, and Resaca de la Palma. Uh, the US uh, invaded Mexico and ultimately won. And the Texas Rangers were really prominent in that war. And the war ended with what's known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in that treaty, the United States got half of Mexico. It got all of that red territory right there was ceded by Mexico to the United States uh, in that treaty. And then a little later on, we bought this southern part called the Gadsden Purchase so we could build a railroad across. So that's how you get that part of uh, the western United States. Now, we, we got our current boundary in 1850 in a compromise. California, we discovered gold. California is full of people looking for gold. California wanted to be a state. Uh, and so this agreement was made that California could come into the United States as a free state, and we would organize these territories of New Mexico and Oregon, and Texas would give up that portion of the republic right there that includes most of New Mexico and Colorado all the way up into Wyoming, uh, and some of, the, of what, was, what was our what's now in Oklahoma and Kansas, north of Texas. And we, so we gave 67 million acres and got $10 million for it. And so that paid off all of our debt and uh, it established our modern boundary. So that's how this part of the Texas boundary came about 
in this compromise of 1850. All right, we've got a new state. We've got a in Texas and California. Gold is being discovered in California. There's huge opportunity out west. We don't know how to get there. It's, it's nothing but no man's land between Austin, Texas and, and El Paso. We knew how to get from El Paso. So uh, we, uh, we create this new line of forts uh, along what was then the frontier. Fort Worth, you'll recognize. Some of these other ones you might not. Uh, Ing is uh, um, Uvalde. Fort Duncan is Eagle Pass. Uh, so they would form a new line of forts protecting our frontier. Now these are U.S. Army forts because we're now a state and the United States Army has a responsibility to protect Texas. Here's the road story. And so between 1848 and 1849, we had several expeditions from San Antonio and Austin out west to El Paso. And so we found how to get there with water and all of that. So we get the new roads uh, uh, to get us from the southern part of Texas out to El Paso. And that occurred in the 1848-49 period. Here's a population chart. Uh, we had, you know, we're still growing, but we really were growing back then. The population in 1850 was 212,000 people. Uh, you can see the split between white and black. Uh, there were a few free blacks at that point in time. And, and here's the population in 1860, just before the Civil War. It more than tripled in 10 years. So we had huge growth at that point in time. As far as the Indian affairs, as we said again, Houston wanted to accommodate them. Lamar wanted to drive them out. Uh, uh, most of the Indians were reasonably peaceful, but the Comanches and the Kiowas were not. And uh, so we had problems with the Comanches particularly. They, they kept coming. So we formed, in 1855, we formed two reservations for Indians in Texas. Uh, you can see the part of Texas it's in. It's in Young and Throckmorton counties. Those are up here. We had one reservation called the Brazos Reservation. For, let me just call them everybody else. It's all of the other tribes. And then we have one particularly for the Comanches. But we just, the Comanches just wouldn't stay on the reservation. About half of them would go off and they'd go down to Mexico and raid. And they were also continuing to raid against the Texas settlers. And that caused all sorts of unrest. And finally, in 1859, it just wasn't working. So we closed down both of these reservations and we took all these Indians to Indian territory, which became Oklahoma. So we've got a new line of frontier forts in 1860. Uh, let's see some Fort Stockton and Fort Davis. You'll recognize those. Concho is at San Angelo. Uh, and then we had some Richardson, you may recognize by Dallas. So we had a new line of and Fort Bliss is formed. Uh, by El Paso. So we get a new line of forts in 1860. We, from the day we were a republic, we wanted railroads. We talked about them for the 10 years we were a republic, passed some charters, never built a, a mile of track. And until 1853, we built the first railroad between Houston and uh, Harrisburg so we could connect up with the, with the ships that were coming into Harrisburg. So that's uh, uh, the Buffalo, Bio, Brazos, and Colorado. And then we built some more rails out. We made it to Hempstead, and we made it to Allerton, which is near Columbus. And we actually got up from Hempstead, uh, past Navasota, to a little town of Millican by 1860. And we were coming down from the north. We had a little piece of a railroad that came into Texarkana and made it as far as Jefferson. And then the Civil War started, and that stopped all of the all of the rail development for the years of the Civil War. So here's a uh, here's a, a, a Texan Confederate soldier in the Civil War. Uh, we voted to secede from the Union uh, on February the 23rd, 1861, and it was uh, what is that? Three to one. Uh, to secede, 
the counties that voted against secession are shown in darker brown. That's the German belt. Most of the Germans, they didn't come here. Uh, they, well, they came here to be in the United States, so they didn't want us to see. These counties out here were mostly just military forts, so the voters were U.S. soldiers. They didn't want to succeed. And up here, we had a whole bunch of brand new United States immigrants who also did not care to secede, but they were overwhelmed by the rest of the population, and so Texas joined the Confederacy. As a Confederate state, uh, before the war started, the estimate was that we were split about a third, a third, a third. A third said we'd rather be a part of the Union than we would be separate. A third were, that's after the war started, a third was the Confederacy, and a third said I don't care either way. Sam Houston said we should not have seceded. We ought to stay neutral and not join the war. And as a result of that, he was removed as our governor. So he wouldn't sign the pledge to the Confederacy he got kicked out as being governor of Texas. Uh, we said to all these young men in Texas, come join the army, and a lot of them said, fine, I'll do it. They were all cowboys, and the saying was, they, 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 I don't think we, we organized any infantry. It was only cavalry. And the story was, no Texan walks a yard if he can help him. He's gonna ride his horse. Uh, and so uh, the Confederate soldiers seized the federal property in forts, moved the, the federal soldiers off. Uh, our main focus, you know, Louisiana was a Confederate state, so we didn't have to worry too much about our eastern border, but we did have to worry about the Gulf, our ports on the Gulf, and the Rio Grande in New Mexico. So most of the early Texas Confederate soldier focus was, was the Gulf and, and West. And one of the reasons for that was we got all of our money, or most of it, from exporting cotton. So we hauled cotton on wagons from Central Texas, where it was grown, down into Mexico, across into Mexico, put it on ships and sold it to Great Britain. So cotton exports are really important, and we needed to be able to get the cotton there. We, everybody thought the war was going to end soon. It did not, as you know. And in 1862, we had to start drafting people. We'd run out of volunteers. So that was a, it happened and it was a problem. Uh, El Paso was occupied by the Union troops. All of our ports were blocked. Galveston was actually occupied by Union troops. And 1863 come on, comes on, it's more of the same. The Confederates liberated Galveston, uh, but the Union soldiers occupied Brownsville and Indianola. Uh, we had lots of shortages. We couldn't get supplies in because of the blockades. Uh, all the men were off in war, so women were having to manage the, the plantations with the slaves. And at the end of 1863, there were 90,000 Texas men in the Army. 1864, we had Indian troubles. They sensed an opportunity and took it. And so we had raids. Austin newspaper man named Grip Ford, famous Texas Ranger, uh, he was a Confederate leader, and he took a bunch of troops down to Brownsville and took Brownsville back from the Union Army. Uh, and now we also had a, a, a Union tribe to invade Louisiana, had a big battle over there, and a bunch of Texas soldiers died in that battle. So 1865 is the end of the Civil War. Uh, Appomattox surrendered. Um, Jefferson Davis, the president, was captured as he was trying to escape. And after that happened, uh, Rip Ford is down in Brownsville, and he hadn't heard about all that yet. And so he gets in a fight with the Union soldiers down in Brownsville and wins big time. So the last battle of the Civil War was fought uh, near Brownsville, and it was an overwhelming Confederate victory. Uh, and then soon after that, Ford finds out that, in fact, we've, we've given up. And so all of his troops disband. Uh, uh, it was a, a period of a lot of anarchy going on and the troops returned to home. Many of the Texans who were Confederates and didn't want to stay moved to Mexico. 
And this story I think you're probably familiar with, but on June the 19th, Gordon Granger, a Union general, sailed into Galveston and he gets off and, and he gets up and he makes an announcement and he, he announces the fact that the slaves have been freed, which happened several years before, but he tells the Texas African Americans, you're now no longer slaves, you're free people. And that occurred on June the 10th, as we've come to know it, and it's now a national holiday uh, celebrating that fact. The Union Army shows up, uh, two wings of the Union Army, they come into Texas, one of them occupies Austin, the other one occupies San Antonio. One of the leaders of the Occupation Army in Austin is George Armstrong Custer, who we know later from Little Big Horn fame. Uh, he had his wife with him. And so here's a picture of, of Custer and his wife Libby sitting on the steps of today's Arnold Nowotny building on the little campus over at UT. At that time, it was called the Blind Institute, but it's the same building as you can see. And so there's an 1865 picture of Austin, Texas with George Custer in it. So we have Reconstruction after the Civil War. Uh, <clears throat> Freedmen's Bureau was found. Um, the Democrats win from the Republicans. Democrats were the locals. Uh, it was a problem in Reconstruction. And finally, by 1870, we were readmitted re to the Union. Uh, Democrats got the control back and Reconstruction ended. Uh, the Radical Republicans tried to split off Texas in another one of those. They created a constitution of the state of West Texas, and they tried to actually pass it and split Texas in two, but it didn't work. San Antonio was going to be the capital, uh, but it never got enacted. So that was the most serious attempt. Cattle drives, you know the story. Uh, we ran a few of them before the Civil War in Ohio, and then after the Civil War, we started in 1866, and for about a six or seven year period, we ran 25 million cows out of Texas, mostly to the packing yards in Chicago, and some of them went all the way to Wyoming and started the stuff up there. We used to have a lot of buffalo, something like 100 million we thought in 1840. Uh, we started killing the buffalo pretty rapidly. Uh, there we are. Uh, skinning some buffalo out of the prairie up in the Panhandle. There's a pile of buffalo hides waiting to be shipped back east to Dodge City. And there's a pile of buffalo skulls from 1875. And that's people right there. So we, we almost wiped out the buffalo. And the Comanches didn't like that. And so we got in a fight with the last of the Comanches in what we call the Red River War. And it was all over. Uh, eliminating the buffalo, which was their, their livelihood. So we had several battles. The biggest one was which occurred in Palomero Canyon, September 28th. And in that battle, uh, Randall McKenzie was the U.S. guy, and he, and he uh, overwhelmingly ran the Comanches out of Palomero Canyon, the ones that were there. They were led by a guy named Quanta Parker. And we killed 1,400 of the Comanche horses, and that was their livelihood. So they were in big trouble, and as a result of that, Quanta Parker had to lead the rest of the off-reservation Comanches back to Fort Sill in 1875. And so there were no more, all the, all the Indians were on the reservation after 1875. Joseph Glidden invents barbed wire in 1874. That soon came to Texas for all the reasons that you can imagine. And so people started fencing off what used to be public lands. Some people didn't like that, so we actually had a war in Texas against the people who were building fences opposed to those who didn't want the fences. Windmills came in 1885. That was a big deal because now you could have a fenced-in piece of property that wasn't on running water. You could water your cattle inside of a pasture by putting in a windmill. Panhandle ranching began in the 1890s. So there's some ranchers uh, out in the middle of nowhere running cattle. There's the chuck wagon behind there. That's, that's all they had where they, they had their deal. Bunch of, bunch of uh, timber in East Texas. Uh, pine and cypress were the two main trees we liked. 
we hauled them out first with oxen on, on, uh, uh, on oxen trains, and then later on we built some railroad spurs into the forest. So we were bringing out the trees. We put most of them in, in the Sabine River and the Natchez River, and we made these rafts of logs, and we floated them down the river. And this is Orange, Texas. There was a couple of big sawmills in Orange. We would stop the raft and take the logs up and make lumber out of them. There was some more sawmills in, in uh, uh, Port Natchez on the Natchez River. And so they, the same thing happened on the Natchez River. So that was our, tip, our uh, timber business. We got back in the business of building railroads in a big way. This is the miles of tracks in Texas in 1861, 470. By 1829, 1879, we're about 2,500 miles of track. This is an 1876 picture with the black lines being the railroads. And by 1890, we had more than 10 mil and 10,000 miles of railroad track. The way we did that is we had all this public land we offered the railroads, we said, if you will build a track, we'll give you the land on eight miles on either side of the railroad. And that is uh, 10,240 acres per mile of track. So that's how the railroads got their money to be able to build the railroads, just by the, the land that the state of Texas gave them. We raised a lot of cotton and in Central Texas, from Austin all the way down to the coast, we we um, ox wagoned it to Houston, uh, maybe rail for for a while here, and in Houston we put it, took it down to Harrisburg, put it on boats, and shipped it mostly to Britain and uh, the textile mills. So King Cotton was a big piece of the Texas economy around 1900. We settled the Panhandle, which was absolutely nothing but a giant prairie before with buffaloes on it. The settlers came in, uh, they built these soddies, these little houses out of chunks of dirt. We got our horses and mules and oxen and we plowed up the prairie, we plowed the native grass under and we planted wheat and it wasn't long when that caused a problem. And we got a drought in the 30s, we got the dust bowl because we had plowed up all the land uh, we'd also invented big tractors to help do that in a hurry. So that this activity ended up causing the Dust Bowl for the most part. But we got the Panhandle settled. And here's what I call the last hurrah. So we got the Spanish-American War that started. Guess what? There's a bunch of Texans that used to be riding the, the cows and up the trails that didn't have a job anymore. And they're young kids looking for something to do. Teddy Roosevelt says, aha, he comes down to San Antonio and he sets up camp in the Baker Hotel, still there right across from the Alamo, and he gets, this is a legend, which I think is a pretty good one, he gets a barrel, of, a wooden barrel outside the Baker Hotel and he puts a silver dollar on it and he said, come one, come all, if you want to join my Rough Riders, here's a silver dollar. And a lot of them did. So that formed his Rough Riders, and then he went to Cuba, and there's this, uh, you know, the San Juan Hill uh, story with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. Those were a bunch of Texas cowboys that did that. So, uh, you know, we didn't invent oil in Texas. It first came out of the ground in Pennsylvania. But in 1866, a, a well showed up in Nacogdoches. It was a small one, 10 barrels a day. And in 1901, a couple of guys that were pretty smart, one was a geologist and the other was a promoter, they're down there near Beaumont, and they said, you know, we've got this salt known, and I think there might be oil under it. So they drilled a well, and they didn't get very far down at all, and they hit a gusher. And that is an actual picture of the spindle top well. It was the first big oil well of Texas. And when this thing was going, and it, you know, what a mess it made. You can imagine, that's, that's just coming back to the ground. So you got the entire ground full of crude oil. It produced 100,000 barrels a day. And at that point in time, that was three times 
the total production of the total consumption of crude oil in the United States, one well. And so that, that started it, and, and pretty soon thereafter, we had oil wells all over the place. Uh, East Texas, and then it spread around to a lot of the other parts of the state. So here we are all the way up to 1900, and we've got our legend well established. We are a bold and proud country with a deep history. We've got cattle, cotton, and oil. Those are the important things. And we've got a bunch of people who are still really fairly close to the frontier, and that helped us out. And so throughout the 20th century, we grew, and this is a story that you all know, we grew to where we are now, which is a pretty important state. I think we still have a bold and proud history. We're a little bigger than cattle, uh, cattle cotton at all, but we still have those things. And a few people may still be close to the frontier. So uh, here we are. And that's it. Thank you for your interest. And I would love to hear any questions or comments or stories or whatever you might offer. There's Roger. Yes, all the way through it. Uh, at the beginning of the period, uh, 1836, Spanish was the predominant language, but it's still spoken today. So the, the answer is yes, all the way through. Percentage, well, the percentage dipped. It's going back up now, but anyway, it, uh, yes, Spanish is still an important Texas language. I think you asked uh, this, Jim, but when did Mexico finally uh, declare that we did? get independence from them. In uh, the Treaty of, uh, oh gosh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, thank you, 1848, okay. when we settled the war, okay. they finally said, oh, okay, here, that's a part of the United States, and not only that, here's California and Nevada and all the others too. Yes, yes. Ruth. You're going to tell us more about Cynthia Parker. Cynthia Parker. Oh, yes. Cynthia Parker, as I, as I told you, she was captured uh, in 1836 at Fort Parker, and she went on to live with the Comanches, and she grew up to be a woman, and she married a minor Comanche chief and had three kids, one of whom was named Quanta Parker, and he's the most famous later chief of the Comanches. He's the guy that was the last holdout and was in that battle of Palavera Canyon and led him back in. So that's uh, Cynthia Ann is Quanta's mother. She had another son uh, named Peanuts, whatever that is in Comanche, and he was killed. And then she also had a daughter, and I don't have her picture, it's kind of a touching picture, but she was, I don't know what the right word was, I, she was recaptured as probably her. She'd become a Comanche. And uh, uh, some Texas Rangers found her and some other ones, and so they brought her back to her family completely against her will. I mean, she's married to a Comanche. She wants no part of it, but she was forced to go back. And there's this really poignant picture of Cynthia Ann, and she's holding her young daughter. She's nursing her young daughter, Prairie Flower. And Prairie Flower died, and, and so did Cynthia. So it's kind of a sad story that Cynthia Porter. How were the first presidents of the Republic of Texas Selected. I mean, was there like a legislature, or did somebody just say, I'll do it, or? How, how were the first presidents of the Republic of Texas? Pretty much like we do them now. Uh, they were nominated, and they went up to a public vote, and they got voted in. Who voted? The Texan, the people of Texas voted. The Texas citizens, the, the Republic of Texas citizens voted for their president. One particular interesting thing, the Constitution did not allow a person to run for re-election. So can't you say Houston was the first and the third? That's why Lamar was in between. Did y'all hear what Bill said? He said that the first Constitution of the Republic did not allow a person to run twice. 
And that's why it was Houston Lamar, Houston Jones, because Houston couldn't be reelected directly. There was a written constitution. Yes, well, yeah, we had a constitution early on. Sure. Were there anything like the land grants in Oklahoma to attract immigrants? We had, I forgot the number exactly, I want to say 66 million acres of public lands. And we gave most of it away in the form of land grants. So the answer to the question, was there land grants in Texas like they had in Oklahoma, the answer to that is absolutely probably more land was given away than was given away in Oklahoma. But we had a lot of land. The railroads got some of it, as, as I mentioned, but most of it went to individuals. The first uh, uh, deal was, you, uh, you could, it, it, it changed as time went on, but probably the most common land grant was 640 acres. That's one square mile, and we call it a section. So if you're a rancher out in West Texas, you measure how much your ranch is by how many sections. So if you say, I'm, I'm ranching 100 sections, that means you're ranching 64,000 acres. Here's an add-on to the land issue. How did Texas pay for its brand new capital it built in the 1880s? How did Texas pay for the brand new capital that was built in the 1880s? We had all of this public land the legislature of the state of Texas passed a law that says we're going to set aside, I believe it was three million acres of the Texas Panhandle. We're going to set that land aside uh, to provide the financing to build a new capital. So in 1881, we had a capital building where the one is today, and it burned down in 1881. So we needed a new capital, and we looked around, and we said, okay, we've got this land. And so we put it up for sale, and there were 10 investors who bought it. Uh, they were mostly foreigners, a lot of them from Scotland for some reason. But anyway, they, uh, they formed a ranch called the XIT Ranch, and that stands for 10 in Texas. And I don't have a picture of it here, but it, if you look at the Texas Panhandle over on the New Mexico side, it's a, it's a pretty good chunk of that land. We sold the land, we got the money, it was enough money to build our capital. We went up here to Mar Marble Falls to a mountain and we mined the mountain and, and cut it up into blocks and hauled them back to Austin and built the state capital. So we, we traded land for a capital as a bottom line. Something kind of interesting in regard to the local uh, we had, if you all know, uh, 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 Central Texas, we, in the, about 1937, started building a dam to create Lake Travis, and uh, we borrowed money from the federal government. Uh, and some, <laughs> some uh, bureaucrat got to digging around and found out that there was a law that <clears throat> there could be no uh, unless the United States, the, the land had to be free before you could uh, loan money to some, for, for some, something like a dam or any public thing. Well, uh, so uh, Buck, uh, help me, uh, Buchanan, Buck Buchanan. Buchanan said, don't worry, I'll fix it as soon as the legislature meets again. Buck, you can't, Buck, Buchanan, where's another dam named Buchanan Dam, Buchanan dam. up and died, had a heart attack and died. <laughs> and, but somehow we managed to get the law changed and it was okay. And we were able to fi finish the building of Lake Travis, but uh, or, or create Lake Travis by finishing the dam on, because we you know, had still maintained our, our, all our public lands. Thank you, Carol. In thank, thank you because you have allowed me to say I told you so. <laughs> I, I knew that people in this audience would know everything about Texas history <laughs> from 1900 <laughs> to 2023. <laughs> yes, Mary. We had a speaker here one night, and he brought me, had a lady with him, and she said she was a rancher, and I was having dinner with them when we were having the seminar speakers, and I asked her how many acres she had. Someone said to me, Mary. Yeah. 
I don't know if you could hear Mary, but she was commenting that there were some people here that spoke, and the woman said she was a rancher, so they had dinner. And uh, Mary asked her, not Mary didn't know any better, she asked her an honest question, she thought, which is, how many acres do you have? And uh, she was informed that you don't ask a Texan how many acres you have. Sometimes they'll say, I'm ranching 100 sessions, but you don't ask them, they have to offer it. In the back, yes. So I, I couldn't quite hear you. Can somebody else repeat the question for me? The question was, Texas Rangers being used in and around the Civil War to capture freed slaves and bring them back to Texas. Is that, is that so the question is that during the Civil War, there were slaves that weren't freed yet who, who, who uh, went into Mexico. So the question is, were the Texas Rangers sent into Mexico to capture them and bring them back? And I, I am not aware that that happened officially. I know that there were certainly some slaves at the time who ran to Mexico, and I know that some of them were brought back, but it, I am not aware that there was any official act by the Texas Rangers to do that. My wife says it's time for it to stop.